could ask your questions in the chat or just remember them and I can add address them at the end. It's not a super long presentation, um, but that way, because I'll be going over all the Finch stuff and if you have questions after the Finch stuff, I can go back and we can go over certain things. So um, yeah, so this is sort of consider this your winter Finch primer. Um, and I'm going to start about why this is happening. And what are what like when you hear uh, eruptive species? What is what makes up an eruptive species? So um, basically, it's not eruptive. It's not like a volcano. Um, it's with an I. Uh, basically, eruptive uh, means that this species makes irregular movements year to year. So um, as many of we in us know, we have a bunch of warblers that every year you know, they arrive about the same dates, they leave about the same dates. Uh, there's, it's a pretty consistent pattern. Um, but a lot of other birds don't do this. Uh, so this is really based on their food supplies. Uh, so basically in their core wintering range, so um, usually up north for most of the species we're talking about, if food is abundant, they stay put because that's where the food is. Uh, if it's scarce, they move a farther afield to uh, to find food. So uh, this this year, um, a lot of the cone crops and seed crops up north uh, in Canada and Alaska um, are uh, pretty poor. So a lot of uh, these birds are coming down south to find food. Uh, and this is not limited to just finches. Uh, I use a blue jay for this slide because blue jays are an eruptive species. Um, probably, so interesting. I noticed a ton this fall. Uh, especially in October, they seem to really come in um, from up north. Um, but red-breasted nut hatches are, as many of you hopefully have been seeing, lots of. Um, they're also eruptive. Uh, snowy owls are too, uh, and bohemian waxwings, which we don't get, but um, they are, uh, both are very far northern boreal birds that um, will move every winter, consider, you know, depending on the food. Um, so I saw, uh, so this, is if you see up here, um, the, op the date is October to February 2017 to 2018. Uh, so this is for pine siskins. This I pulled this off eBird, um, I think last month. So you can see every year there's like a smattering of pine siskins. Um, this was a fairly poor winter. Uh, of course, we have a lot of pine siskin reports in the mountains. They do breed up there, but uh, you can see fairly light purple to no reports in a lot of places. So this was 2017 to 2018 compared to this year. Now I did take this about a month ago, but you can see the huge difference in pine siskins. So this was basically October, November, 2020. And that's just two months. Um, so you can see this huge difference. And remember this one here is just the matter of two months of just pine siskins. So you can see the dark purple all across the Northeast. Um, I'm sure many of you have gotten tons of uh, pine siskins at your feeders. Um, but this is really kind of a classic eruption year phenomenon. So basically, you know, every winter, some of these species will show up, um, but during eruption years, they show up a lot. And I see a little comment in chat. So I'm gonna see, um, oh, it doesn't, I can't quite see the chat, I think what, while I'm presenting. Um, so I'm just going to address the questions at the end, uh, so that way I don't have to stop the presentation. Don't worry, that's that was just me doing something. I'll keep an eye awesome. on the chat. Okay, thank you, Judy. So I'm going to focus on six eruptive finch species. Um, so this is this will be pine siskin, purple finch, red crossbill, evening grosbeak, common red pole, and white wing crossbill. Um, and I'm not including the residents that we get, which are house finch and gold finch. Um, both of these are migratory. American goldfinch is actually an eruptive species, but uh, we have them year round. Uh, and they're, they're, while, you know, numbers do fluctuate every winter, um, we still have them. We have resident populations and we still have northern ones. So these guys, this, this list, we don't get every winter. Um, so they're all eruptive. Um, so we're going to start with pine siskins, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Uh, hogging your feeders. These guys swarm your feeders. They're kind of like a little plague. Um, and generally, I consider them one of the small finches along with uh, goldfinches and red poles. Um, they're all very small. Um, 
and they're the brown streaky ones. They're not uh, usually too bright or flashy, um, but they do have some nice yellow in the wings and tails. Um, this one here photographed, uh, I think this was in actually Washington. They're found across the country. Um, this is a male. So the bright yellow uh, in the, the wings and in the tail indicate it's a male. Um, sometimes you'll see some with very limited yellow. Those are usually females. Um, and there's also what's called a green morph. Uh, I didn't find, I couldn't find any pictures I could use with uh, permission for this, but um, the green morphs are very pale compared to your average pine siskin. Um, so paler than this guy. And uh, they usually have, it, it's sort of hard to describe, but the base color, so the base color on this guy is kind of brownish. Um, on the green morph, it's actually more yellow um, or greenish. It's kind of a weird name. It's not the best, but uh, basically they're yellower and paler. Um, and one of the better ways to identify them is the undertail will be yellow, um, yellowish. So uh, you can kind of barely see it's whitish here, but uh, they're kind of, a, I think, considered one in 100 um, color morph. Um, we know so they're pretty cool. Nordstrand. I'm sorry? I'm, okay, um, but yeah, if definitely, uh, they do stand out like a sore thumb. So if you have a flock of siskins and you notice one's kind of yellower and greenish or pale colored, um, that might be a green morph. Um, so they're highly social, they're rarely seen alone. Um, sometimes you will find one mixed in with a flock of goldfinches, um, but usually you don't see them on their own. Uh, there's usually a bunch around. Um, and they often associate with goldfinches and red poles, so the small guys. Um, so best way to find pine siskins besides getting your feeders swarmed by them is uh, listening for them. So they've got a, a variety of calls, but I put two here. Um, this one is the watch winding or zipper call. It's a really cool sound. So that's a really cool mechanical sounding call. Um, and I usually hear them when they're, uh, hear that call when they're in groups together, just sitting, not really when they're flying around. Um, so they're all perched up and just hanging out. Uh, I've heard that that call mostly just, you know, they're, they're uh, calling to each other. Um, this second call here is the flight call. So this is really what you want to listen for uh, when you're just out birding uh, and, you know, just hearing some of these birds will just fly over. Um, so this is a really high, um, kind of hard to put into words like a jeer. Oops, uh, I didn't mean to click that, but um, so definitely listen for that. Um, I've heard brown headed nut hatches sort of sound a little uh, similar. They sort of sound squeaky uh, or wiry. Uh, it's it's an in, it's a very unique call, um, and if you can detect it, that's a really good way uh, to hear pine siskins flying over. Because sometimes they'll fly over silently, other than those little flight calls. Um, but hopefully, it should not be too hard to find pine siskins this time of year. This year, <laughs> um, I've seen them just about everywhere. Uh, and a common thing that I see a lot of people asking me is pine siskin versus goldfinch. Uh, so this is a particularly bright male um, winter plumaged goldfinch. Not all of them have this yellow face. So that's the disclaimer. But um, if you got them side by side like this, it's really, it's really nice. But if you don't, um, main thing to look for on a pine siskin is these striping. Uh, pine, uh, goldfinches never have any sort of stripes on them. Um, they're very plain, uh, clean breasted. Uh, pine siskins will have stripes all the way down the breast, the belly, and the sides. Um, the wings are also a good thing to look at. Uh, so goldfinches only have, have these really nice jet black wings with just a wing bar, a single wing bar. Um, pine siskins also have the wing bar, but they've got the yellow in the wings. Um, so it's especially evident when they fly. You can really see that yellow stripe in the wings. Um, so if you get some cool photos of them, you know, fluttering around, uh, you can catch that bright yellow. Um, the head 
so definitely look for streaking on the head. They usually never, pine siskins never have any sort of yellow on the face. Um, so like I said, this one is a particularly bright yellow goldfinch. And um, some of them are more of this buffy tan color or gray, um, but usually never brown with any sort of streaking on the face. And then the bill, um, both have similar bills, but the bill on a pine siskin is very thin and fine. Um, really designed to get smaller seeds. Um, so you kind of want to look for the same, the opposite things on a goldfinch. So goldfinch just have clean breasts, no stripes, nice, neat jet black wings with that white uh, or buffy colored wing bar. Uh, no, you know, yellow in the wings, um, no extra stripes. And um, definitely, usually they have some sort of yellow on the face or on the throat. So next is purple finch. And I'll talk about how to identify these in just a second, because that's always a big one. Um, males can be described as a finch dipped in raspberry juice or wine, whatever you prefer. Um, they're really pretty, uh, in my opinion, just gorgeous little finches. Um, and uh, definitely the best way to detect them, other than getting them to your feeders, is listening for their uh, flight calls. They're very quiet and insect-like, um, so I've got the sound down here. Um, the females uh, are actually very co easily confused with uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks, except for the fact that we don't have any grosbeaks in the winter. Um, they've got this bright white eye line and the bright white, uh, that's a malar stripe there, so that bright, kind of a little white mustache. Um, and the males are this nice rich raspberry color. Um, so often confused with house finches, but first we're going to talk, to, uh, sh show you the um, calls. So these are the flight calls. So um, again, if you're out birding and you're just trying to find a purple finch, this is something to listen for. To me, it sounds a lot like a cricket. Uh, and oftentimes, especially like in October when we still have crickets around, I've heard crickets that sound exactly like this. So um, just use caution. You know, if it sounds like a cricket's coming from the sky, it's probably a purple finch. So it's a very quiet pick, pick, pick. Um, it's quiet, but it does carry very far. Um, so definitely keep an ear out for that. Uh, and if you have purple finches coming to your feeders right now, it might be a good idea to sit out there and listen to them um, so you can associate yourselves uh, with the call to the, the bird. Um, but yeah, I'll play it again. Very cool. So definitely listen for that. Um, you know, if it's a quiet, quiet morning, sometimes you can hear them flying over or uh, they'll be sitting up in trees giving that little call. Um, they also have this cool little, it's like a Vireo-like call, um, but I don't hear that as often as I do this one. So how to identify them? Um, I think usually the males are the most easily mixed up. Uh, I always see people getting these two confused and that's, Pretty, uh, I, I don't blame them. Um, I've seen some very bright house finches and I've seen some fairly dull purple finches. So there's a little bit of overlap, but uh, for one, looking at uh, the flanks in the side here, um, you'll see on a house finch, there's some blurry streaking on the sides and the red doesn't go down the sides. These are pretty brown and white sides. Purple finches don't have these streaking, the, the streaks on the sides and the purple or raspberry color um, goes all the way down. Uh, so it's more extensive. Um, the, oast, the other thing is to look at the wings. On a house finch, the wings are not going to be this nice raspberry color. They're gonna be usually brown. Um, I usually would also say, look at the mantle too, this part here, the back. Sometimes house finches or really bright males will have red on the back. So it's not like a perfect um, tip. Um, oh, so male, so it's not the best picture to show this, but male purple finches usually have sort of a crested appearance. Um, I think I'm going to go back. Yeah, you can see this picture here. He has a little peak to the head. Um, so they only show that it's sort of like cardinals, you know, when they're excited, this sort of peaked um, appearance. So it's not 100% reliable, but it's a good point towards purple finch. Um, 
house finches don't really have any sort of crest or peak. They usually just have this little round head. Um, and then the bill. So if, you can, if you're getting photos or getting really good close up looks uh, at purple finches, you'll see that the bill is fairly straight. So the Coleman, which is the top edge of here, is a straight versus house finch, it's curved. Um, so house finches have sort of this curved look to the bill. Purple finches have a very straight um, edged bill. It's very conical. Um, and also this sort of mask, this, if you turn this photo black and white, you'll, you'd see that there's a dark mask with a pale, you know, uh, eyebrow here and pale stripe down here. That it's very contrasty. Um, house finches rarely ever show that much contrast in the face. You don't really see any distinct markings here. Um, so yeah, all those points for purple finch. Uh, house finches are usually duller, um, way more common too, I will say that. Um, right now my feeders are covered in house finches. Um, but the they're browner, so brown wings, brown on the sides, and they usually have these blurry streaks um, that male purple finches never have. Now for the females, I personally find this an easier ID uh, because the females tend to be very contrasty. So like I said before, if you turn this photo black and white, you'd see a dark mask with this paler eye stripe and paler um, stripe down here. Um, so if you turned the photo of the house finch female over here, you'd see there's no distinct markings or anything. It's just a very plain face. Um, so that's the first thing to look for uh, if you're confused about which finch you've got. Um, the other is, in general, um, streaking here is so going to be a lot bolder. Again, if you turn this black and white, you'd see that these are dark streaks on a pale background. Uh, on female house finches, this is going to be just kind of blurry streaks on a browner background. It's less contrast. Um, and the bill is the same thing, too. Uh, so purple finches have a very straight bill with straight edges. It's like a triangle. Um, House finches have this rounded bill, uh, so it's sort of curved at the top and curved in the middle there. Um, I thought this was a particularly cute house finch. Uh, usually they're not that cute. Um, and another tip, uh, since this photo before didn't really show it, is the white belly. Um, purple finch females have this really bright white belly that uh, can be seen from you know, a naked eye from quite a distance. So that's a really good way to tell um, tell them apart from house finches, which really, really have this, the same blurry streaks. Um, no real contrast. So purple finch females are, they're quite pretty in my opinion. I like them Richard, a lot. Um, well, uh, Martina, we do have a question. And sure. I think we, since it's so early, um, somebody, uh, Chris wants to know, uh, are there any instances, instances, instance, I can't say that. <laughs> you know of any <laughs> when house finches and purple finches hybridize? So I can say um, that word. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they can hybridize. Um, to my knowledge, I don't think they have any overlapping breeding. Well, I think they do have overlapping breeding ranges, but their breeding habitats are usually pretty different. Uh, there are two populations of purple finches, um, one out west, which would breed at somewhat lower elevations. Like I think they breed just outside Seattle. Um, and then the eastern population, which is the ones we get, they breed pretty high up in like boreal forest. Um, so house finches, are, as we know, are very suburban. Um, so there's not going to be a lot of overlap between where they, the two would breed. Uh, purple finches really need some nice, pristine habitat. Um, so you don't have to worry about hybrids. One has never been documented. Um, it's 2020, though, so I wouldn't be surprised if somebody posted tomorrow on Facebook, hey, what's this bird? It looks like a purple finch house finch hybrid, and it turns out to be one. Um, but it's never been documented, so you don't have to worry about hybrids, thankfully. Um, and actually, I don't think they're actually as closely related as you might think. Uh, they do look similar, but um, purple finches are much, clo much closer to uh, Cassin's finches, which are a Western species we never get. Um, but yeah, good question. Any more, Judy? No. No. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good point to, to uh, ask questions. So at, at the end of the little species demo, so evening gross speaks the one that's been in the news and all you know the talk of the town. Um, these guys are big, beautiful, and hungry. 
Uh, so they're definitely our biggest winter finch. Um, they're closely related to cardinals, so they've got that big, heavy bill. Uh, and they're a little bit smaller than a cardinal, a little chunkier, not as long and slim. Um, but they usually are very social and they'll visit theaters in large swarms. That being said, down here, we probably will get one or two small groups, usually not groups of 100 or more, but um, who knows, we can dream. Um, and they're pretty mis unmistakable. They're big, they're noisy. Oh, you wanna watch it. <laughs> um, they're big and noisy and yellow, um, gorgeous. Uh, so really hard to mistake for anything else. Um, and they're definitely the e most uh, easily detected by birds calling overhead. Um, so I know Kevin Metcalf had one earlier uh, this uh, last uh, month and he had heard them. Um, and a lot of the reports in North Carolina so far have been birds just flying over. Um, of course, they will stop at your feeders, uh, but definitely that's the best way to listen for them. And there are four different types or sort of subspecies of evening grosbeak in North America. Um, so out of the four types, the ones that would show up here are type three, which I know it sounds sort of like a disease, but um, the best, uh, we'll go over types in just a second with red crossbills, but um, basically these types uh, have different breeding ranges, have different uh, sounds, and they have different food sources. Um, so they're different little populations. Um, so their calls, and I've got this recording of a group, uh, I think this was taken up in Minnesota, um, to me sound very vaguely like house sparrows, but it's a very rich rolling call. They've got a bunch of different calls, um, but I best remember is cheer, cheer. Cheer. And you hear that rolling call in the background. That's also their flight call. So you'll be out birding hopefully one day this winter and you'll look up and hear this cheer, cheer. Um, so that's just, the, those are the calls that they give when they're flying over, it's sort of contact calls and flight calls. Um, the other way to detect them is really tough. Uh, it is hoping, they, they often sit in trees eating seeds silently and hopefully you just come across the tree that they're feeding at. Um, it works for some people, but uh, otherwise you're, I think your best bet's either listening for that call, which I'll play again in a second, or getting one to show up your feeders. So here's the calls again. But yeah, cheer, cheer. They're very cheerful birds. There are some pigs. Um, they love black oil sunflower seed. So I'll, I'll touch up on bird feeding at the end for a bit, uh, just, you know, what seed attracts what finches, but that is their favorite and they will pig out on black oil sunflower. Um, and I also included a flight shot of a couple gross beaks here, just uh, in case you're looking up and you see some a flock of birds flying over. Um, they, so the females here have this little white patch in the wing. Um, to me, it reminds me of sort of like a pileated woodpecker type pattern. And the males here have this big white splotch on, um, on the inner wing. And that reminds me of a red-headed woodpecker usually. Um, so this big white splotch is pretty unmistakable. Um, you know, if you get photos of them in flight, again, they're very unmistakable birds. Um, there's hard, I, I personally can't imagine much that you would uh, confuse them with unless you're from a really far distance. Um, some, I've noticed uh, that they sometimes do mix in with cedar wax wings, um, but not all, like not, it's a loose connection. It's not really, um, it's not really a tight formation or anything. Um, and I just wanted to comment that this gross speak up here, so there's no way to tell immature uh, male gross beaks. Um, all the gross beaks will get either look like the females or look like the males, um, because by the time the males get here, they look like adults. Um, but it looks like sometimes female gross beaks can have this white patch in the wing as well. Um, it doesn't, apparently it does not mean that it's a young male, but uh, it's definitely interesting. Um, there's some variation in the individuals. So 
Um, this is definitely, I think out of the winter finches, the most exciting. Um, they're really cool. Uh, so next is red cross bills, um, which I know I had one uh, down here in Union County um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, so these guys are very unique finches. Um, some people call them the, the boreal parrots or northern parrots because um, they got these really unique hooked bills that are crossed. Um, so that helps them get into uh, cones of conifers. So pine trees, and I apologize for the dogs. Um, they're happy that my mom's home. Um, but uh, they've got these really crossed bills that uh, help them get into cones. So spruce, fir, pines, um, that's what they use. They, they actually move their bills side to side to get the seeds out. Um, so the adult males, this is an adult male here, are this nice bright red. Uh, and the adult females are yellowish and gray. And the young males are pretty cute. Um, they're kind of in between. They're sort of splotchy red and splotchy yellow. Um, and then the juveniles, which we shouldn't be getting, are like, they actually look a lot like house finches, but with a really crazy bill. They're brown and streaky. Um, so there are different, there are 10 different North American call types. So um, if you go on eBird, you'll probably see that there's a uh, notation for type. So you see type one, type two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, type nine actually got split into the Kasha crossbill. So that's found in uh, Idaho and it's found only there, doesn't migrate, um, has a really cool ecology with uh, the lodgepole pines, I think there. Um, so that was considered its own species, but the rest of these um, are sort of considered subspecies. Uh, so they're all found in different areas of North America and they're all tied to different sorts of uh, trees. Um, so if you go up to our mountains right now, um, you probably would get type ones, which are the Appalachian uh, type. So they eat um, mostly pines like uh, Fraser fir, uh, well, fir and pines um, and spruce, uh, Fraser fir, red spruce, uh, table mountain pine. Um, and they don't really migrate too far. Um, they're pretty stationary. Um, type two, so the, I, I put these are the five most expected types. Um, type two is a Western type. It's usually found out in Colorado, Wyoming, um, the interior West. Um, and they're tied to ponderosa pines. There's type three, uh, which is Western hemlock. So these are more of a Pacific Northwest, interior West uh, type. Uh, type four is also uh, a Western. Uh, so this is Douglas fir. Um, is the, the tree that they're tied to. Um, and then type 10, which is actually the one that I uh, reported uh, at King Creek Park. Um, this is the, the one that's probably the most expected right now. This is the Sitka spruce crossbill. Um, so these guys breed in Eastern uh, Canada and Newfoundland uh, and New Brunswick. Um, and they're tied to the Sitka spruce up in the boreal forest. Um, so how the heck do you tell these types? Uh, Good question. It's the calls. Um, so get recordings if you do encounter any sort of cross bills. Um, they're trying to figure out which ones are going where. Um, there are actual differences in the bills, but, but there's no way you're going to identify one to type because of the bill. You'd have to actually have it in your hand and measure it. Um, some have thicker bills, some have thinner bills, some have longer or shorter. Um, kind of think of them as almost like the Darwin's finches of North America. There's a really cool um, variation in the bills, but it's not as extreme. So this is a little slide um, of four call types that are probably the most likely, or I wouldn't say most likely, but ones to keep an eye out for in North Carolina. Um, so here's our type ones. Uh, the spectrograms here are really key to identifying these because you'll find that uh, I'll play type one and type two. You'll find that they sound pretty similar to your ear. Um, but on a recording or a spectrogram here, you can see that the shapes are very different. Um, so here's type one. This is our Appalachian one. So that's what they sound like. They, the sort of the call is a jip jip. Um, it's very bright, uh, kind of a nice little call. Um, so type two sounds very similar to my ear, um, maybe a little slower, but uh, you can see how different they, they look. It's a little deeper. It's 
So a little different, but not not exactly easy to tell in the field, which is why they recommend you get recordings. Um, so if you're thinking, oh man, these are really hard to tell apart. Well, type four here, which is not a common one to show up, but this they're trying to track them um, coming east. These guys sound completely different. It's very bright. It's almost like a vit vit, um, and it goes up instead of going down. So like jip versus vit, um, it even makes a sort of V shape. Um, so these guys, the Douglas fir ones, uh, they're not common in North Carolina. I don't know if there are any actual accepted records, but um, they've been showing up in the east a lot. Uh, and in the past they have shown up. So they're trying to uh, track um, where these guys go because uh, you know, if they're flying all the way from Colorado just to come over here, well, that'd be really cool to begin with, but they also want to understand uh, why. Um, and then here's type 10. This is probably the toughest type to call off uh, just because it's a very variable type. They have a bunch of different little calls. So if it wasn't hard enough, they don't even stick to this kind of call. Um, they do a lot of different ones, but they, they're they uh, shorter and more electric sounding. Deep, deep, deep. The other calls are sort of their contact calls. That's the flight code. Deep, deep. So very, very bright to me, almost kind of squeaky, uh, high pitched little call. Um, so they do, this is like I mentioned earlier, this type 10 is the most expected. Um, and of course, you know, if you run into crossbills, uh, you probably don't, you know, if you, if you don't get recordings, that's okay. They're all still crossbills. Um, but uh, it's definitely really interesting to see, you know, where these birds come from. Um, and, uh, you know, if you do get, uh, audio of them, upload it to eBird, or uh, you can send it to the Finch Research Network and they'll identify it for you. Um, it's a lot more complex than I thought. I thought I had it down, um, but then I I didn't. So it's it's pretty tough. Um, but yeah, that's probably a little too long on um, crossbills, but they're really cool. Um, so here's, we're going up to now the really, really rare stuff. Um, but these are expected, you know, possible during a, uh, a crazy finch year like this. So common red poles. Um, so like I mentioned, I consider these the one of the little finches along with gold finches and pine siskins. Um, they're very small uh, and they're very northern. Um, so many people have gotten their life for up in Minnesota, especially Sac Zimbabwe um, or upstate New York or Ontario. Um, I think both these photos are actually taken in Minnesota. Um, but they only come south during big eruption years. This is one of them. Um, and compared to pine siskins, uh, they're very pale. They're whiter um, or grayer than a pine siskin. Uh, they've got that cute little orange or yellow beak. And then what they've got the red pole, which is that little cap um, that all of them have. Uh, so that's a really distinctive way to, uh, to tell them apart from your other streaky finches. Um, Adult males like this one here have this rosy blush. Um, not all of them do. Some will have just a plain streaked breast, um, but sometimes you might get lucky with a male. Um, and they're often mixed in with goldfinches and pine siskins. So it's always good this time of year, you know, the chances of one showing up are pretty low, but there've already been a couple in North Carolina this year, mostly in the mountains. Um, so just double check, you know, the finches that come to your feeder, um, just look for that little red pole uh that little red cap um and picking them out by ear is a little tough um i'd recommend if you think you have one definitely try to record it uh so that way you know you can listen to it because to me they sound like a a mix between a goldfinch and a pine siskin which is confusing um their calls are drier kind of whinier um and they've got this very distinctive trill uh that the other finches don't do so this is a recording of a bunch of different calls that you might uh, expect from a red pole. That's like the normal.
We'll get that little trill somewhere in there. Yeah, there, there's a, some trills. You can hear it's sort of a whiny. I was gonna say, um, and goldfinches can have a very similar little uh, call, um, as long as that chit chit chit. Uh, some pinetiscans can do that too. Um, so definitely, you know, be cautious if you if you think you hear a red pole. Um, it's always good to record them. Um, of course, it's better to see one. Uh, but if if you can't uh, find it in the flock, it's you know not a bad idea to record it if you think you have one. Um, and they, they really like goldenrods. So if you can find a big field full of goldenrods uh, that you know have set to seed, uh, that has a lot of goldfinches, that would probably be the spot a red pole shows up other than a feeder. Um, and if one of us does get lucky enough, I kind of threw this in here, the chain, there's no state records um, and some people disagree that this is even a real species. This is a hoary red pole. Um, they're sort of like the frosty version of a common red pole. Uh, they're paler, they've got a smaller bill, they're whiter uh, on the rump, uh, and they're whiter under the tail. So there's a lot of debate on whether this actually counts as a species or not. I say if you get a red pole down here, it's still a good idea to rule out a hoary red pole because that would be first off an amazing find, and second it's a winter finch, it's a big eruption year, um, anything can happen. Crazier things have happened, um, so it's not—it's not never bad to to be uh, one hundred percent. That's sort of like the same with the, the hummingbirds that we're we're um, dealing with right now. They're probably rufous. They're almost completely, definitely rufous. But um, you know, you, we want to be one hundred percent sure that they're rufous, not ninety-nine percent. So good to check your red poles. Um, and like I said, some people don't even think this is a species. So. It might be considered one species instead of two uh, in a year or two. <laughs> we'll see. Um, you have to do all these genetic testing and stuff. So this is the hoary red pole. And then this guy is probably the rarest, uh, I would say, quote unquote, expected. Um, there is already one uh, white-winged crossbill in North Carolina this year over in Raleigh. Um, so there was one, there could be more. Um, so this is a, another very far northern finch. Um, most people get their lifer in Minnesota. Um, these are both taken at Saxon Bog. Uh, and they are the, uh, um, the third species of crossbill in North America. So there's the Kasha, the red, and the white winged. Um, so they only come down south during major years. Um, there were a few, the last big eruption year was 2013, 2014, that winter. Um, a few showed up in North Carolina, but mostly on the coast. Um, that being said, there are records for Mecklenburg and Union counties, and I think maybe Gaston County. Um, I have the birds of the Central Carolinas, if you guys don't have the book. Um, you'd have to look it up in there. But uh, definitely, um, there's a precedent for them, and they could show up here. So um, they like spruce and fir cones, uh, and they're really cool. They're very parrot-like. They're more parrot-like than uh, red cross bills. They'll actually take cones off the trees and bring them to perches to eat. Um, they'll hold them in their little uh, feet and uh, take the seeds out, which is really cool. Um, and they're very tame usually, because I think for the most part, most of their lives, they've never seen a human. They live in Royal Canada most of their lives. So um, they can be pretty tame. Um, the adult males are, I would say, are fairly unmistakable. They're this almost salmon pink color. Um, it's almost like fluorescent uh, with the double white wing bars. Um, they're not like the deep red color like red cross bills are. Uh, the females can definitely be um, a little trickier to pick out. Um, they're yellowish, uh, kind of, you know, with some blurry streaking, um, but they still have those bright double wing bars. Um, I believe the person who had the white wing crossbill this year up in Raleigh almost mistook it for a goldfinch because at a first glance, you can kind of get, you know, they've got this dark wings with the white and, you know, yellowish, um, but they're definitely the crossbill. If you see a finch with a crossbill, you've got a crossbill. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, again, if you've got a big swarms of feeders, uh, finches at your feeders, always good to double check. They're just a little bit bigger than um, pine siskins. Um, 
down here they usually show up in singles or in small flocks um so you know it's unusual to find more than five i would say down here uh even in big years um but usually one will show up um and then the best way to detect them is there's flight call uh to me it sounds like a you're plucking a taut wire like a sort of a, it's very electric sounding to me so this is what it sounds like So it's very kind of electric sounding, kind of like little lasers almost. And my tip, big, my big tip for this one, um, and actually I probably looked kind of weird because I've been going around um, looking. Uh, if you have, if you know of any ornamental um, spruce or fir trees or hemlocks, um, I even thought about like Lada Park has these planted hemlocks there. Um, they will visit those uh, if they've got cones on them. So, um, you know, if you if you see any of these big spruce trees or fir trees that are like the ornamental ones um, that got these big hanging cones off them, keep an eye on those this winter. Um, you never know when a crossbill might stop by. This is really what they prefer because I guess it's the only thing that they know. You know, they're looking for these cones. Um, Otherwise, it seems in North Carolina, they're best detected at feeders. Um, usually most of the records show up at feeders. So um, I, I know a lot of cemeteries will have those planted evergreens, the um, ornamental ones. Uh, but yeah, you might have to brush up on your uh, tree idea. I'm not really good at it myself, but um, looking up for these uh, spruces and firs. Um, but if you see a big coniferous tree with these ha big hanging cones on it, that's probably a good tree to look at. Um, just keep an eye on. So this is, how can you get this jam-packed feeder in your yard? There are, I believe, 10 evening growth speaks on this feeder, plus a little pine siskin and a little goldfinch. So I like this photo because you can see how big the growth speaks are. This is just a little five inch goldfinch right there. And they're just towering over her. Um, so this was taken in Cape May, uh, and you can see these guys are pigging out. Um, so for feeders and seed, uh, as many of you know, I used to work at Wild Birds Unlimited, one of the bird stores. So I'm not gonna be like too biased. Um, you can call me out if I am. Um, but if you want to get purple finches and evening growth speaks, go for a platform feeder like this one. Um, the bigger, the better. And feed black oil sunflower. Uh, black oil sunflower is the gross speaks favorite. Um, it is a favorite of many other birds as well, so it's not a bad seed to feed. Um, so definitely, and gross speaks seem to really like these big uh, open places to perch. Um, tube feeders and finch feeders. Uh, so this is an example of a tube feeder here. This is a squirrel proof one. Um, tube feeders are good for your smaller finches. Uh, so gold finches, pine siskins, uh, Red poles, if you're lucky, um, do like these sort of tube-shaped feeders. Um, and if you go to a bird store, you'll see that there are finch feeders. Uh, that's specifically to feed uh, thistle or niger, which is down here. Um, that's very fine, small black seed uh, that um, the small finches really like. Uh, so if you're going for siskins and gold finches and maybe a red pole, um, you can try out a finch feeder. Uh, there's several different styles available. You can get a finch sock. Um, and I would recommend, again, I'm trying not to, I'm trying to be neutral here, but um, my store would sell this finch blend, which is thistle mixed with chopped sunflower seed that's hold. Um, so there's small, tiny bits of sunflower mixed in. And that's super popular with my finches. Um, during the summer, I have like two or three families of gold finches that just empty the feeders. Um, so definitely thistle uh, and black oil sunflower are going to be your finch favorites. But also, going native, I'm sure you guys are all Audubon members, you've probably heard it and like it's been driven in your head a million times by now, but um, native plants are always big for finches. Um, they definitely are probably better at attracting finches than feeders just because that's what the finches know. Um, so definitely, uh, don't deadhead your garden. I understand if it's too late. I know it's winter, but um, maybe next year don't deadhead. Um, a lot of people definitely get goldfinches on, like I, I know I get them on my zinnias. 
um, but they like any sort of sunflower, um, purple cone flower, black eyed Susan, um, and goldenrod's a big one. Um, so if you, you know, leave your flowers alone uh, in the fall, the finches will have a nice uh, natural food source. Um, and then planting native trees or just letting them be if they're already in your yard. Um, so purple finches and evening grow speaks like box elder. Um, I probably should have included a photo of what box elder looks like, but it's a it's a type of maple. So the seeds are the uh, the Samaras, which are like the little helicopter seeds, um, and they dangle now this time of year uh, from the tree. Uh, that is the big draw for evening growth speaks. Um, so if box elder and other maple trees, if they've got the seeds on them, keep an eye on those trees. They could have growth speaks um, and sweet gums. I know everyone hates their sweet gum in the front yard because there's all those spiky gumballs, but finches really do like it. Um, and, and other birds, I've seen uh, chickadees get on the, them and titmice and um, uh, I'm pretty sure I've seen cardinals try to, but fail. Um, and then like I mentioned earlier, crossbills do like conifers. Um, pines, I will mention white pine and uh, the smaller pines, the short leaf and Virginia pine are gonna be more popular. But spruces, firs, um, even ornamental spruces and firs uh, are definitely good crossbill um, attractors. Um, so definitely a lot of, I, I'm gonna try to nip this in the bud, pun intended. Um, a lot of people ask me, where are my birds? I don't see any birds this time of year. Um, it's because there's so much natural food out there. Um, you know, if you go out to the, you know, the, the nearest greenway, you're gonna see seeds everywhere of you know uh flowers and trees so the finches are going to prefer that first before any feeders um and here are some sources i can send these out if you guys are interested i highly recommend the finch research network this was started this year um and it's all about finches uh not just the finches i covered but finches from out west finches from around the world um they, they talk about all sorts of finches. And it does include the winter finch forecast, which this year they were pretty off. They were gonna say, oh, it's not gonna be a great year for finches, but it turned out to be an amazing year. Um, so it's not 100%, but it's still a really nice resource. Um, eBird, of course, I'm, I know almost everyone here does eBird, but uh, if you wanna keep track of sightings, you know, see how far these finches are going, that's always great. Um, Project Feeder Watch is always good too. And one big tip for me learning finches was watching the Ontario feeder cam. So this is a live bird feeding cam um, based out of uh, Ontario. And they get, they get all the finches I just mentioned, except for like cross spills. So they get gross beaks and red poles and uh, pine siskins. And you can watch it live. They get a lot of other cool birds too. And it's a really good way to kind of familiarize yourself with what these birds sound like, but also how they act, how they behave. Um, plus it's just cool background sounds. So yeah, and here are all the credits for all the photos that were not mine. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, uh, did we get any more questions, Judy? Um, I don't see any, but people can yeah. turn off their, um, really how if people want to turn off their um, uh, or turn on their mic, they can ask their questions too, or they can type in. Uh, okay, who I heard something. There we are. Um, questions, comments. No questions. Oh, come on. I want to know. Go ahead, Anna. You have to unmute yourself. I have to find my okay. mute. Um, there it is. I have a question about the, the feeders, the flat feeders. I've got to find yeah. a place to put one so that the squirrels don't get in it. But I've been told to separate the feeders for disease reasons and for competition. But then when I see them on the cams, they're all together. Does it, can, can we kind of try to duplicate what we see in our yards where we have the one feed, you know, the flat feeder with a good number of hanging ones nearby? Or is that too crowded? Um, I mean, the objectives are different. One is to bring the world in and see all the birds, and another yeah. one might be different. But that's sort of how my feeder setup is. Um, I do they're all together. Yeah, I've got only like so. Again, I'm not trying to like vouch for my store or anything, but like we sell like a feeder, you know, 
stand set up yeah. basically and it's several hooks and um i think the main thing is you make you want to make sure birds are going to do this anyway but you want just want to make sure it's not as often um that they don't poop on their own food right um, especially with the tray feeders that can be a big issue um so all my feeders i've got the tray mounted but it's like going off to one side and the other feeders are off to the other side so that way um it's not falling right directly on the tray feeder of course when the birds are sitting in the tray that's going to happen anyway right. um and disease is definitely uh, a thing that a lot of people notice especially with their house finches uh, with the eye disease um and i know by now we're all really used to you know diseases and pandemics and all that um you can I, I'm going to mention it. Uh, you can clean your feeders with one part bleach, 10 parts water. Um, and that'll sanitize it. Just be sure to rinse it afterwards. Um, and I'd also recommend if you have a really high volume of birds, definitely um, spacing it out. You know, like I sometimes I'll have to actually ration the birds out a little, just give them a break so they sort of disperse a little bit. And then, you know, have some, like I'll sanitize the feeders um, if there's a particularly bad outbreak and usually I also rake a little bit underneath if you can, um, just to, you know, so the, the, the second part is do the, do you, do finches prefer open air above or are they okay with a little cover? Um, it depends on the finch. Um, some like goldfinches really like open areas. Um, I think purple finches and gross beaks tend to prefer some sort of canopy. Uh, do you mean like a yard structure or? No, like like the little um, dome oh. that you can put over so okay. the rain doesn't sog up the food. Yeah, um, I don't think that's really, a, they don't really have a huge preference. Uh, okay. I was going to mention hopper style feeders, which are the house looking feeders. Um, gross beaks like it as well. Uh, the important thing for the big gross beaks is they need a place to sit. Um, and a lot of the small tube feeders have, their perches are way too small. Um, for gross speak to fit on. So um, I think that's why they prefer the platforms as they have a lot of room to, you know, you know, to hog <laughs> all the food. Um, but yeah, any feeder that has a big enough perch, if it can fit a cardinal, it can fit a gross speak. I would say that is a good reference. So I have a question. Yeah. You said the, uh the crossbills with that uh, bill. Have you ever watched them at a feeder? I mean, I've only seen them in trees in their natural habitat. Um, I just find it uh, interesting that they would be able to actually um, take a seed from a, a feeder. I I have personally have not watched them at feeders. Yeah, I've only ever seen them you know, yeah, in their natural habitat or like flying over. Um, however, I ha I think, I mean, they must be able to get out of it. Um, uh, yeah, just, I, I think their bills are still able to crack seeds um, and they must be able to maneuver it. Um, I know the one up in Raleigh, the person was feeding sunflower chips, so he was already hulled. Mm -hmm. So it didn't have to do any shelling, but um, I know up in like Grandfather Mountain, they do get um crossbills to their black oil sunflower feeders so they they somehow get it out um i'm not sure exactly how but uh yeah you would think with that that bill shape it'd be really tough for them yeah it, you good thing you uh, mentioned grandfather mountain because that is one place if you do want to see them in the in the state and they don't show up at your feeder or whatever they are there they're mm -hmm. resident birds up there yes uh, which it, you still it takes a little while to find them though because they move a lot actually i'm a little tip this is not i think very um like uh applicable to us but they like gravel um they need grit to help digest uh the seeds that they eat um and actually here i'll, I'll share my screen again um this photo of a, a red cross bill you can see was actually let's see here um taken it's on the ground and that's what they this was actually in Virginia um and that's what they do is they pick the gravel off uh this is a little gravel pull off up in the mountains so um that's pretty neat the you know if, if you're up in Grandfather Mountain um I've seen them up in Roan Mountain uh doing the same thing apparently they'll do that in the parking lot 
So, you know, just keep an eye out if you're ever up there looking for them uh, in, in the parking lots.